thank everybody for coming out tonight. And especially I'd like to thank Ron for making the space available for us to uh, have this presentation. And Dwayne and his brother Chris for putting everything together. So without further ado, I think I'll turn the time over to Dwayne and let him get started. All right. Thanks, Edward. Um, so I'm curious um, how many people uh, have seen the, um, the presentation that we gave at the, co the Exploring Conference uh, a year and a half ago? So about a third, something like that? Okay. Um, so this is meant to be sort of a, a primer, um, as well as uh, to go into a little bit more depth um, uh, in what we've seen since then. Um, so I, I want to explain a little bit about the, uh, the motivation. Um, the, re the hypothesis, or at least the, the, the assumption that we're going from is, now that we know the Book of Mormon is um, a regular book, uh, where did it come from? Um, we think that some of what we've done shows evidence that it could be, you know, it could be further evidence that it's a regular book, but we aren't necessarily taking the, this, the claim that this, this proves it's all uh, made up. It's just more of a further exploration. My perspective on the Book of Mormon is kind of like, or the feeling that I have is like it's an old video game. You know, sometimes you want to go back and play the, the classics and uh, bring it out and like, you know, it's nostalgia. And um, sometimes you want to go a little bit further. You want to find out like, what's the, actually the maximum high score on this game? Can I take it all the way? So that's kind of what, I, what my brother and I, Chris, did. We're, we're uh, using some algorithms and we put our geek on and try to do some things to, to find more information about this book. Because really, I mean, and I think many people share the same feeling here, you were kind of growing throughout your life in Mormonism. And then when you leave, um, the growth doesn't just stop. You want to keep growing. And so this is part of my journey for growth. Um, what's really cool right now is that the 19th century is being digitized. Um, everything that we know, everything that we have recorded is being turned into um, things that are searchable, indexable, um, computable. And um, it's happening for free. Um, that was sort of the starting point that we took when we, when we went on this journey. Um, Archive.org is amazing. Um, millions of books are available for free. Uh, you just have to download them. And they don't even have bandwidth caps. I mean, you can just keep downloading and downloading books. Google Books is similar. They're a little bit more proprietary in the way that they do it. Some of their books aren't um, available as free texts, but you can at least search through books. And we have all these universities that are collecting data and just scanning like this, um, bringing books uh, into, the, into the digital domain. So um, uh, one of the things that um, so, so Chris's original talk was um, uh, how the Book of Mormon destroyed Mormonism. And um, what he means, and I'd like to kind of put the context around that, what he means is that questions that can be turned into an algorithm are um, being coupled with knowledge that can be put into data. And when those two collide, you get answers that have never been known before. And our ability to, to do these kinds of things is increasing exponentially. So. Even if the late war is totally a wrong hypothesis, and I, don't, I, I think we're still onto something, but even if it's totally fake, we're still going to be able to continue pursuing new answers and new frontiers in Book of Mormon research that was never possible before, and that's really exciting to me. Um, this was our original study in uh, 2013. We analyzed 110,000 books. Each of these blue dots, which you can barely see here, is a, is a book. And what we have here is the number of the words, the number of words in the book. And then over here is we have how many rare, um, we we'll call them phrases, but they're four grams in this study, how many rare phrases matched with the Book of Mormon? And they were non-biblical. So what that means is we were ignoring words like, um, and it came to pass, because that's a very common phrase. So that doesn't actually uniquely match the Book of Mormon with anything else, because there are lots of books like that. Um, but if you find something like Title of Liberty or something like that, that's much more rare. So you want to be able to weight those and, and uh, in, increase the significance of those matches. So what we found here, um, I think many people have seen this. If not, um, I'll just briefly go over this. Um, so uh, anything that perfectly matches the Book of Mormon would basically be this line. It would just it would be all the way down. Um, and then we had, uh, so you can see the Book of Abraham is a pretty close match. First Book of Napoleon over here is a pretty good match. Um, book of Moses, holy cow, strange cow. Uh, you know, Moses speaks like Joseph Smith. 
but um, <laughs> we have the late war um, between the United States and Great Britain. We also have the Book of Commandments, I think you can see over there, which is very similar. Uh, so, so those are the matches, and um, this is the late war, uh, right here. I'm just going to hand this around. This is a 200-year-old book, so please treat it nicely. Um, but feel free to open it. Don't crack it open all the way. <coughs> I'm just going to pass it around, and uh, you, can, you can take a look at it. But it was a very common book. Uh, Rick Brenner, this is from his personal collection. He has six of them. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a particularly difficult to find book in the uh, early 1800s, published in 1816. And um, it was about the War of 1812. So I kind of really like this because on my journey I've always wondered like, why the heck does God want to talk about war all the time? Like, it's just kind of like, I want more spiritual stuff. That's the way I was thinking. And, and uh, we'd kind of slog through Alma and stuff. But um, we think that this matches uh, significantly. Um, here are significant matches. I'm curious how many of you have seen this already? I'm going to show of hands. So again, about a third, maybe a little less. So these are some of the matches from the, the late war in the Book of Mormon. Um, the fourth day of the seventh month, seventh month, which is the birthplace of Columbia, Liberty, and Independence. The fourth day of the seventh month, which is the tenth year of the reign of the judges. Both referring to um, periods of time when we switched from the rule of kings to rule by vote, or rule of the people. Um, the latter in, in the Book of Mormon isn't necessarily claiming that it's uh, uh, the same as the day of, it's not saying it's the first day. It's just related, right? It's sort of, it goes along with our hypothesis that um, maybe Joseph Smith read this book, and then some things were kind of ruminating, he had some ideas, and then he kind of remixed it and added um, a cool story. Um, so um, over here near Moravian Town, some Book of Mormon, um, some LDS apologists have claimed that uh, Moravian Town was not known until 1912, and so it was ridiculous for Joseph Smith to have, um, to have known about that, and how could he have made Moriantum like that but from that town. But here we have uh, Moravian <coughs> Town and Tecumseh in the uh, same sequence as Book of Mormon. Um, here we have 2,000 hardy men who fought freely for their country. Um, they were men of dauntless courage. Here we have 2,000 young men defend their country. They took their weapons of war. They were keeping value for courage. This is one of my favorites. So if you think about Joseph Smith and his time, uh, they just came to this. It's, it's, like, it's basically, basically the equivalent of us going to Mars, right? It's like people just moved over to this new world. It's totally fascinating. They're, they don't know what to think of it. I mean, early in four, you know, late 1400s is probably even more so, but they're still exploring what this land is about. So they're kind of like interested in explaining it to people. This is it's, it's plentiful. This land has gold and silver and all manner of creatures which are used for food. And um, in the Book of Mormon, they happen to be European creatures. But um, they also have um, the mammoth and the elephant, which is an interesting idea. So um, the elephant is, is uh, not claimed to be in North America in the late war, but it is in the Book of Mormon. It's an interesting connection. And um, also we have Kirlams and Kumams, which um, uh, I forget who it was, one of Joseph Smith's associates claimed was a mammoth. So um, interesting parallel there. Uh, so here we have uh, weapons of war, with the great slaughter, Ditches surrounded. So these are fort. Basically, these are um, uh, descriptions of battles. And in this particular case, it's centered around a fort. And they describe the same thing in the same sequence. Um, here is uh, digging trenches around um, around these forts. So in the War of 1812, it was common practice. I mean, they were they were building trenches to save themselves, uh, to defend themselves against the, the British. And this was like military knowledge. This is what they were doing to, to prevent attacks. Um, so many more here. I'm not sure how many I want to say individually, but I just kind of wanted to give context for how many rare matches there are in these two books. Very interesting. Um, for me personally, another favorite that I had was the Liahona. Um, not for certain that this is an exact match, but if it is a match, it sure is cool <laughs> because um, 
in the late war, this ball of curious workmanship is a torpedo. It was basically the very beginning of um, uh, timed warfare on the seas. And so they had clocks in them. They would toss them out and then um, with a clock uh, blow it up at the right time so that it would, go, it would just destroy a ship. And uh, so we see here that you know we have clock and spindles. Um, it's made out of brass. It's a ball. Curious workmanship. I, I've always wondered, you know, why did God put that little ball next to the tent, and uh, and why it was curious, and you know, what was this thing? I, I always remember thinking, like, what if we could like go and get that technology? It would be so amazing because God made it. So uh, that's that's one of the things I think is cool. Um, this one I am going to go into further uh, detail with, but um, this one is really amazing. Um, and then. Uh, here we go, Borders of the Land of Zarahemla, Borders of the Land of Columbia, we gathered together. All these phrases are very similar. Chief warriors and chief captains laying their weapons at the feet of some special uh, military leader. People to rise up one against another in their own families. Uh, both all are right against the city. And um, this is the longest match that we found. It came to pass in the same year that the people of Columbia were revenge of the evil came to pass that in the same year that the people of Nephi had peace restored unto them. So um, these are all coming from wordtreefoundationgithub.com stuff.io slash the late war. So if you want to visit that, um, it goes into detail on all of those. Some people wonder, you know, how much of how much of the phrases are you skipping with the ellipses? Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's a little. So you know it's it is interesting to, to look at that more. Um, so here's one of them that I really like. The river battle. So in the late war, we had a battle raging with great violence, and the men of Britain strove hard to pass over the river called Saranac. And um, I remember reading this, and uh, while well, reading the Book of Mormon, and thinking, um, so is it a river, or is it water? Like, that's weird. I don't know. I was wondering, which, which of, why are you describing it in two different ways? Well, here we have a parallel. Um, it's a river called Saranac, and um, they're on the opposite side of the water. They slew them with a great slaughter, and then um, they drove them back from crossing the bridges. And they were slain in the river, so the waters of Saranac would die with the blood of the servants of the king. So all of the people went into the river. And uh, basically, with the same language, um, here we have the servants of the king, but here we have the guards of the king. He slew them, drove them back, cleared the ground on the west side of the river instead of the opposite side uh, of the river Sidon, throwing bodies of Lamanites Lame Lame which had been slain into the waters of Sidon that thereby his people might have room to cross and contend with the Lamanites. And I, another thing that's kind of weird to me, uh, it's kind of implicit here, but why did they need room to cross? I mean, it's a river, right? It's like miles and miles and miles. Why can't you just kind of go around the people who are on the other side of the bank? Um, maybe there was a bridge, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe some mental imagery prevented uh, the author from thinking in terms of uh, a wide river there. Here's another one. This is a tower speech. So um, this is nearing the end of the War of 1812. Uh, uh, I don't know really the exact month, but um, in the late war, we have um, this man, uh, Willis, who is giving a speech. And um, he basically, he, he gets up on a, on a podium. Uh, here we have the word rostrum. Um, and talks to the people. And the people gather around. 30,000 of them gather around. <coughs> And um, they pitch their tents from the surrounding country. They pitch their tents, and they assemble together. So they assemble together. They gather themselves together. And uh, this is a very old man. He's like in his 70s. And um, people shouted with a loud voice uh, because of liberty in their country. And um, he says that he's very old, and his bodily infirmities were, uh, if he didn't have these, he would keep fighting for his country. And, um, and that's the same message. The same sort of things happen uh, for King for Mosiah, uh, who mentioned him. So it came to pass that the people gathered themselves together throughout all the land, and they pitched their tents round about every man according to his family, for the multitude was great. And he caused a tower to be erected, um, so that people might hear the words that he should speak. He caused them to assemble them yourselves together, and he's about to go down to his grave. Is framed up trouble. So we don't have those same words, but we have bodily infirmities and an aged Willet. So there's some parallels, but not exact words. 
and uh, they all cried with one voice. I think that's interesting that there's the same dynamic between a person and the crowd being described in the same way. Um, so that's it for, for parallels right now. Um, the strongest argument that the, the late war has uh, is that Hebraisms in the Book of Mormon don't really offer any evidence for it being ancient because all of these Hebraisms are also found in the late war. Um, cognate, accusative, negative questions, construct states. Um, Rick Render has put together a great analysis of uh, almost all of these. I, I, I added a few here, but um, these were from other sources, and um, described what they are. But uh, it's kind of, I, I kind of feel bad a little bit, because like I know there are some linguists who are defending the Book of Mormon, and they have some really awesome knowledge that they've, from their domain, and they put it into defending the Book of Mormon, but it's really, they, they just didn't look around enough to see uh, the context. So really, um, that's not, not, a, not a good evidence. Um, so this is the method that we used. I kind of wanted to describe this briefly. Um, it's fairly simple uh, math, so um, I'll just go over it briefly. This is how we score a document. Um, in this case, we're looking at bigrams, so that means two words. So we take a uh, two-word sequence like I, Nephi, and then we say, how many times does I, Nephi appear in 100,000 documents or 50,000 documents? And it appears once in the Book of Mormon. So if we were to find something that says I, Nephi, that would be like a super mega match. It would be like, holy cow, we just found something awesome. Um, but we didn't. There's no I, Nephi's anywhere else. So um, that, uh, that doesn't match. Nephi having, same thing, but having been shows up in a lot of documents. So, uh, 10,000. Um, been born, a little, little rarer than this, but uh, not, you know, not terribly rare. Same with born of. But of goodly, turns out to be somewhat rare. And then goodly parents is quite rare. As rare as I need by in our subset. So we take the inverse of each of them and add them up, and we get 3.04. So as you can see here, the score for this document, if we were just, basically what we're doing here is ranking or, or we're, sorry, not ranking. We're scoring how many rare words there are. <laughs> it's not very useful yet. But um, that score is three because I need five, need by having, and goodly parents are rare. The rest of them are almost insignificant. What we want to do is we want to find the matching rare words, right? So here's something I found. Um, Jonathan Swift says this. He says, my birth was of the lower sort, having been born of plain and honest parents. Plain, honest parents. So. Um, what we want to do is we want to see what's the score or the, the match. How valuable is this match um, in assessing whether there's a connection between these two. So um, there's no I Nephi in there. So that would be awesome if we did. We didn't find it, so it doesn't count. But having been is there. Um, so that shows up here. Been born is there. More now shows up. And parents shows up. So we add up all those numbers, and we get 0.05. 0 .05. 0 .05. So this is not a significant find, right? Um, I, I guess I should explain a little bit more. So what we did in the in the study is we found significant finds, right? We found words that are rare, like um, uh, I don't have the document with me, but um, phrases of four or more matches that matched other documents and were not found anywhere else. So those were the those were what we mean by rare matches. How high does the number have to be for you to consider it significant? Um, in our original study, it was um, if it was found in five or more documents, then we didn't really, it wasn't really significant to us. Um, I guess that's not entirely true. Really, it's just the math, right? If it shows up in one other document, then it's rare. It's going to be a one over two, because the Book of Mormon is, uh, so the two would be the Book of Mormon and one other book. So it's the score as one half. So, so a point 0.5 would be significant. Then? Yeah, yeah, that would that would definitely. Be, I mean, it would. It's it's not like it's not like each individual match is significant, but when you add up significant ones like that, then you get a higher score, and you're like, oh, this book matches a lot, and that's what happened with the late war and uh, and um, the first book of the Um So. So continuing on, so that's basically our first study. Um, what we found, though, is kind of interesting. The late war is one book 
in the genre. It's um, something that's been studied by Iran Shalev, which we didn't know about until after our study. Um, he wrote a book called American Zion, and he's a professor, non-LDS, um, who, uh, so he's, let's see, history department at Haifa University in Israel. So um, he uh, studied American texts that are written like the Bible. And, um, and the late war falls in this, in this genre, so does the Book of Mormon. Um, this whole genre is, is a really interesting genre because it tells us a lot about the early American um, ideas that were happening. They needed, there were, there were a couple things happening. One was um, America was reading a book that it considered holy that had nothing to do with them, right? Like Israel, the Holy Land is far away. Um, the Promised Land, uh, the chosen people, like all of this stuff is really nothing to do with them. But they're like forming an identity, right? They're America. They're trying to create a story about themselves and they, they cherish this book. So they created um, stories around um, the Bible that related to America. They basically biblicized themselves. They created a story about how they are biblical. And you'll get like tons of stories about how America is the chosen land and um, um, that they are the chosen people. And they'll, they'll talk about the similarities between um, uh, the exodus and themselves leaving Britain and things like that were going on at this time. So the Book of Mormon in that sense is not unique at all. It was very much a part of this um, zeitgeist. So uh, these are some of the books that we've since discovered and um, actually we've turned them into electronic like visual documents. These are a little bit harder to find. That's why we didn't have them in our original study. Um, many of them didn't exist in the archive.org uh, stuff, and many of them, if they did at all, were very messy. Like um, when you do OC, uh, when you do scans of documents, they end up with mistakes, and um, it's usually only about an 80% accuracy rate. So uh, it takes a lot of manual work to get these get these going. So this is this is the new um, the new set, and we could definitely use help in either finding, identifying, or, or improving the, uh, the scope of uh, the scope and quality of documents that we have. We've made them publicly available here, so anyone can download them, study them, compute with them. Um, many of them are quite small, so uh, our algorithm doesn't really work with small texts. Uh, what happens with, the problem with that with small texts is that the uh, uncertainty increases. So if we find a match in a small book, um, it could mean something, but it also really couldn't, it really might not mean something. Um, and since that's the case, we, we uh, had to prune the ones that we don't, that aren't very big. So um, this is preliminary results, but um, we kind of wanted to look at the set of documents we have now, and what are the relationships between them. Um, the size of these circles are the size of the books, and the size of the line, or the width of the line, is the um, relative uh, strength of the connection. Um, so you can see that the late war was definitely inspired by uh, American Revolution, which was written 12 years, 14 years before. Um, but the other ones, it's not as clear. There are a lot of, you know, similar numbers, 0 0.1, 0 0.18, 0 0.19, 0 0.2. Um, it's not really clear yet uh, from this particular algorithm if there's a, if there's a really strong connection. Um, so we do have some exciting things that are coming, but we, we don't have any results to show right now. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we, we really wanted to do and uh, have found a method to do is um, studying uh, synonyms. So if you look at sentences and find um, similar words in the same sentence in the same sequence, you know, if you find long matches of sequences, that's also a very strong uh, signal. Um, we couldn't do that with this study because our ability to tell what was synonymous was limited. But there's been some really cool research in um, vectorization of words. So you can basically find, uh, you can take a word and translate it into a large dimensional space and relate them, relate words and their meanings to one another now. Uh, it's all open source, it's all very available, so we're gonna, we're gonna try that next. Um, I think that is close for us now. Um, we, uh, we have a little group, Poetry Foundation, we have a Google group and a um, uh, GitHub 
account where, where we contribute code and things like that. If any of you are interested, um, there are role, there's you know lots of interesting things to, to be done. Um, we aren't particularly, uh, we're kind of a loose-knit group, so we aren't like, you know, if you join us, you have to go do this. It's more of what's your interest? Maybe we have resources. Maybe somebody's interested and they can do it with you, but it's, it's a, a, a loose collective. We have about 20 members right now. So um, that's what we're doing next, and uh, that's where we are so far. Thank you. Two, two questions. Um, what's your background, and have you published any papers on this, or do you have yeah. any plans to? So um, my background is software engineering, um, computer science at Brigham Young University, and um, I don't uh, I, I don't really have the academic connections right now to to like write a paper that I think would be accepted anywhere. Um, prob uh, if I were in linguistics or something more specific, I might. Well, uh, so there was the Stanford group a couple of years back that, um, and some of them even work from here, that I, you might be able to connect with and would probably be happy to publish a paper with you. That'd be cool, yeah. I'd love to, and I'd love to learn too, like there's a lot of information out there in this field that's just booming, you know, like this is almost all related to search engine technology that I just uh, talked about. So there's a lot of money going into figuring out how to make better sense of words. Yeah natural language. Um, okay, so this is from a linguistics perspective, but did you come across any, um, well they're called noun phrases, but the two words or <coughs> uh, that were shared amongst the different books that were supposedly written by different authors? Was there a lot of overlap that you noticed? Um, so there is overlap because it's biblical. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to, um, <laughs> it's hard to s filter out the difference between <coughs> what came from the Bible and what didn't, because um, there are multiple versions of the Bible um, that different authors used back in those days, and and even today, of course, even more. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's harder it's harder to tell what those are. Um, I'm not sure if I completely completely answered your question though. No, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, did or. Did Joseph Smith, uh, did you see any evidence that he uh, came across some new piece of vernacular that was maybe not in parts of the book, but a lot more towards the end, like something was introduced oh. within the writing? Yeah, so we did split the book up into um, thousand word, se word segments and started doing analysis there. Um, as far as new vernacular, it's interesting, the Book of Mormon is, um, it kind of has segments. Um, there, there are definitely some like partition areas where you could say something's different here. Um, uh, it's not clear that, uh, well, at least from what we did, we didn't look for specific new words. We looked for aggregate changes. Um, but like, you know, the war section, Alma and Mosiah and stuff like that, um, is very different from other parts. And in fact, um, Chris did one, uh, one data plot where he showed that. Um, the, uh, it was actually the Quran that was matching more before the war chapters and after the war chapters, and that the late war was not matching before and it was matching during. So it was kind of like, we didn't know what to make of that. It's not necessarily like the Quran is the inspiration for the rest of the Book of Mormon, but there were more matches there and it was <coughs> not war matches. So, kind of interesting. Maybe um, move some stuff around a little bit after he finished it? It does definitely look like that. There are some clear partitions, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Let's start with Edward then, yeah. Much of the Quran has been shown to be plagiarized from the Old and New Testaments. So could the connection to the Quran simply be incidental because mm -hmm. of biblical connections? Yeah, it's possible. Um, we, there, there are some, some there were, we were seeing some rare phrases that were unique to the Quran, but um, in fact, all of the ones that he did were, we, we had removed the biblical, well, we had removed the King James biblical um, language from, uh, from the Quran. So there were some rare matches even still. Um, 
leading up to, uh, while I was promoting this online, I got into a discussion with someone who said, who, who criticized your work saying, the more books you plug into this algorithm, the more matches you're gonna get simply from random chance. Uh, would you care to address that criticism? Yeah, um, I think there's some truth to that. Um, we, we, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to look into the, the biblical genre itself. Um, and the preliminary results here I don't think are conclusive, but um, our algorithm is essentially a search algorithm. So it ranks books and tells us what are the most likely matches, which is exactly what we designed it to do. We were like curious, right? We're, we're explorers. We're trying to figure out what, what would make sense to study further. And so um, when those ones, sh when the late war and uh, first book of Napoleon showed up at the top, we're like, cool, we found something. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's conclusive that these are these are certainly um, sources. These uh, that needs more that needs more work. I apologize, I'm really late, so if you answered this, I'm sorry. Um, how did you decide to include the the late war uh, in and the other books in this search? Was it a random choice, or did you know about these? So from our perspective, it was random, um, but it, it was methodical from archive elements perspective. Basically, we chose books that were ranging from 1750 to 1830, um, and we just downloaded all English books that had been scanned by that organization and ran them through the algorithm. And did you know of, a, of the similarities between these two books before you ran your search? No, no, that was, uh, was, that was part of the surprise. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know of anybody that's been able to somehow art, uh, index or trace back the books that Joseph Smith, number one, had in his house, number two, had available at his schoolhouse or local residence of, of his peers, and possibly even uh, in, in his local congregation or library, things like that, that kind of focus on? Yeah, that would, be, that would be really interesting. Um, I, I know of some web pages that show uh, books that were donated, I, I forget who it was that donated them after, um, but they claim they come from Joseph Smith's library, and um, I don't know if anybody's actually looked at that. Mm -hmm. That'd be really interesting. Let's see, the Quinn's the guy that would have any information on that, but that's, I mean, that's, pretty, I mean, that's a pretty intense task. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard finding old books, but if they've already been digitized, we could definitely run them through the algorithm. I, I know I know this was kind of like a I'm sorry. Uh, sure. I, I know this was kind of like a data search. Um, the, the, the question that would come to me is, um, I guess if we if we operated under the assumption that Joseph Smith was uh, affected by the the late war, do you do you see in um, in the way you're reading the numbers, I, I guess the question that I would have is one is, did it, it, was it just stuff that stuck in his head that he started regurgitating as he's writing the Book of Mormon, or, or do you, is it stuff that he was maybe uh, borrowing from more more cognitively, uh, consciously? Did he have the book in front of him? Yeah, I mean, did you, did you need the data spells that out? Because I, I, I have to be honest, as, I, as I'm watching the word pairings, I'm not, I, this is not, not data driven, I'm just mm -hmm. looking at it. Yep. I, I don't see yeah. someone looking at it and saying, I like that sentence, I'll borrow, I'll put it over here. I like, you know, no, I'm not, not seeing that. I agree with that, yeah. I agree with that assessment. Um, we we kind of go with the idea that, you know, when Lucy Mack Smith was documenting her, her life and she wrote her uh, experience of Joseph Smith, he, he, you know, she said that he um, would tell them stories about the, like the mode of dress and the things that they had, the native North Americans had um, done, uh, you know, according to Joseph, and sort of, he's a storyteller, and um, from from what I, the hypothesis that I use to understand this, this data is um, he was um, a teenager learning things, and that's an impressionable period when your mind is like learning language and acquiring things, and um, that became the type of language that he used um, to express himself in the Book of Mormon. Um, so we only see small snippets. And I don't doubt that he was doing that. I have a hard time with taking too much of what Lucy or even Emma said at face value because there's so much in their books that I, or their, their writings or their yeah. interviews that I can look at and say, yeah, yeah, I don't find that though. So uh, I, can't, yeah. I can't wonder sometimes if Lucy was, or yeah, Lucy was, if she's 
looking back in 1860 or whatever it was when she was writing her biography, she's not remembering things a little bit more conveniently. Than yeah, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to know. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've run this, this algorithm on other books that you know were inspired by, you know, previous books, see if it also creates this yeah, we start, correlation. We started down that. Um, there's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to find digital books that are known to be um, uh, inspired by another one. One thing that we did do was we uh, we ran it through, um, we ran books through this algorithm that were written by the same author, and we did find um, significant matches. It was, uh, you know, I can't say if it was similar to the um, Book of Abraham and Book of Mormon, but that would be an interesting number to compare. I haven't, uh, I don't recall right now, um, but there is like, yeah. Authors use similar word phrases that are, um, in, the, in the big picture, uh, rare, rare enough that it, the word print comes through. Yeah. So um, I, I, it sounds like you're going to keep up uh, analyzing stuff. You yeah. Know, it's a fun hobby. Yeah. So uh, some interesting things that I, I think would be fun to do would be to compare books 1830 and beyond and show you know there's no statistical significance because that adds to your story. Then besides that, um, what Beth had mentioned is comparing within the Book of Mormon itself. Like, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Tanner's uh, book called The Black Hole in Mormonism, mm -hmm. but it basically had this hypothesis that the first couple books of the Book of Mormon were written wow. after the last. So like, um, you, you can see kind of this curve between which and that, where Joseph Smith is changing words where there's this break between the beginning and uh, beginning of Mosiah and and just other you know Joseph it, it, uh, it's just less descriptive in the first couple chapters and it, it, you know so comparing between the book more and using the same analysis would be fascinating and you know maybe seeing if that hypothesis holds up um, you know yeah. as language changes That'd over be really years. cool yeah yeah um, we did do a little bit of that um, uh, a year and a half ago, so I don't recall very very much of it. But um, but the uh, yeah, it was interesting. Like you, even in even in Google Chrome, you can um, like load up the Book of Mormon and then do a, a word search for for which, and it's like nothing. And then like yellow yellow line yellow line yellow line, you know, all the way through the scroll bar. You're like what? And then you switch it, and you're like, whoa, it's here, what? I'm not there. Really interesting to see that. Uh, well, since we're on the topic, I, I also compared like in as much and in so much, and it, it didn't show the same clear delineation. So I don't know, if, you know, if it's true. It, it'd be interesting just to compare more words or phrases like yes. we have. Yes. Yes. Another clear one is the wherefore there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. That's another another one wherefore. fully disappears. Fully disappears later. Interesting. Yeah. Can you go back to your first slide? I don't know if the impact of the Yeah. So, um, uh, so the because it's re it's really hard to see what what you've got on that graph. Yeah. The problem here is um, if you have words, so <coughs> the number of words increases here, right? So if you have large books, the more you talk, <laughs> the more you write, the more likely it is that you're going to have random matches with other <coughs> books, right? Um, so uh, what we had to do was divide out the size of the book. That's why we have this, um, this uh, well, that's why we have this cloud here, where it's like all of these books are being compared against the Book of Mormon, and as you increase, you get sort of like this uncertainty cloud, right? It's like, well, just by random chance, because there's more words up there, it's starting to look more like it's Book of Mormon. But then you have outliers, right? These are the outliers. These are really strangely like the Book of Mormon for their size. Um, so that's why it's significant, and that's why we take this arc to mean um, significant uh, for matches. <coughs> Did that help explain? Yes. Uh, yeah. So <coughs> if I can see that right, on the very far side is the Book of Commandments, right? Yes. Yeah. Which is the precursor to the Doctrine of Heaven. Yeah. 
Um, have you done more work in, in about the statistics of the language that appear between those, the Book of Mormon and the Book of Commandments, to indicate that the Book of Mormon is not an inspired text, but it was actually written by those two because of those similarities? I haven't. I, I would bet, though, that some of the significance here is that he's either quoting the Book of Mormon um, or that... Uh, or, or it could be this, yeah, like you're suggesting, there might be some like language that's like, like weirdly similar, right? And and not anywhere else, which is what that what that looks like to me as well. Yeah, as a follow-up, to that it would be interesting to take the text where the Book of Commandments is directly quoting the Book of Mormon, remove it, yes, and yes. then rerun it from the author. Yeah, yeah, that would be really interesting. Good, good idea. We should do that. Um, <coughs> you, I just have a. Uh, Thing that seems obvious. Um, why did you not just point out the obvious that like most of Second Nephi when they're quoting Isaiah uh, is quoting King James Isaiah? Yes. So we we took out biblical language, so it's not biblical. Um, is that is that what you mean? Like so we, we removed in any in any match that we found between Book of Mormon and another book, we first did a look up to see does this exist in the Bible? And if it does, we just discount it. It doesn't count. Why did you why, why? Did you do that? Was it because it's so similar already and everybody knows that? Yeah, oh. yeah, it's, oh, okay. it's part of our curiosity. Um, also, when we find direct quotes, it it so powerfully weights the algorithm as a match that it's kind of we lose interesting information. Um, so the reason I'm, I'm, that just seems like the ten thousand pound gorilla in the room. Yeah, because if I was on a graduate committee and someone turned in their PhD dissertation and I found whole page after page of Isaiah in it. Yeah. Word for word, I'm like, geez, plagiarized it, buddy, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well I think uh, I think it's less that part is I mean it is it is, right? It's plagiarism from the Bible. But but the, the thing that is less interesting about that is that according to the story, it makes sense, right? So uh, like it's internally consistent that it's quoting from the Bible. Well, oh, he was quoting your PhD professor. Yeah, he's citing us. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, how about the like the the New Testament ish stuff in Third Nephi? It doesn't say he's um, quoting anything. That's true. Yeah, there are some really weird like th I shouldn't have shown up. Yeah, like uh, there's one I think wallowing in the mire or something like that. That's like New Testament's language and it just shows goes up on and on. on. Yeah. yeah. I feel oh, like sorry, I guess. He was, he was first, ahead, if, if that's all right. Yeah, so I've come across the proof of the Book of Mormon several times where they're using that chasmus because it's a Hebrew yada yada. And then I read that cat in the hat, that chasmus <laughs> also, is that true? The chiasmus and cat in the hat? Cat in the hat. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I am Sam, Sam I am. There's uh, chiasmus. Yeah. <laughs> so it is true. Well. So, uh, is that in Chris's presentation? I'm not sure where. You, um, I don't. I'm not familiar with it. I've yet. seen it several times. Okay. And I don't remember where. Yeah. where chiasmus shows up all over the place. According it's, to. It's, oh yeah, um, yeah. Chris actually wrote shows a chiasmus um, detector, and so you can like put any text in, and almost inevitably you will find chiasmus in a book. And the reason for that is because um, chiasmus uh, <coughs> typically is selective. It will it will take this thing, this thing, and skip something important, and then take this thing. And then you know you have your middle of your chiasmus, and then it'll skip something important, and then oh that matches, and oh that matches, and okay. you can go back. Uh, one other and thing. The other the other part to it is that um, storytelling naturally follows chiasmic pattern, right? So you went out of the house, you went and got something in the garage, and then you came back in the house. Like that's a natural. Um, yeah. Story arc. Yeah. Story I have arc. another one. It's not a, a question, but an oh, sure. interesting comment. My dad believes he. Thinks that the the directors of all the what's it? Leonhona you know, Leo, Leo. is an iPad with GPS. Oh mapping. yeah, I totally believe that too. I no. tried to explain to him that it takes GPS satellites. <laughs> 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 they were magical. Satellites. I, that to I totally sure. wanted to believe that when I was little too. Yeah. <laughs> on, on a practical uh, note. When you're doing these analyses, is uh, processor time an issue? Oh yeah. yeah. I think there are several people here who may be willing to let you farm some of that work out to them, so you could do much larger studies mm -hmm. using our computers when we're not at home or at night when we're 
to sleep. It can okay. be running on our computers. That's a good idea. Instead we, of just using so right now I'm uh, I'm doing an analysis of a thousand books, um, cross compared with a thousand books with, with the same set. So there's a million um, data points that we want to get out of it, and it's it's been going for about three weeks on my computer. <laughs> should we should we collect names of people who would be willing yeah, to? Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm, I think uh, the only uh, I guess thing I'd be worried about is um, a lot of what we do is play, and we don't necessarily have like um, scheduled locks that we know we need at this time. You know what I mean? Like there's sort of a um, there's, there's a, an organizational hurdle. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't want to you know use somebody's goodwill um, that they're thinking they're donating, but then actually we haven't been using it for a week, and now we are, and something you know whatever. But um, if sure there's some if there's something, something that works in that sort of scenario, it would be very cool. Yeah. Um, that the uh, list that you showed a couple of slides after this of all the various texts or books. Um, oh yes, I, I found that interesting because I didn't I didn't know that there were that yeah that one's right there. Yeah, there were all of those sort of religiously inspired types of texts in, in that sort of sliver of time. What is the likelihood that Joseph Smith would have been aware of any of these books, or is it more that there were a lot of ideas and concepts? that was floating around that he was just sort of drawing from. Yeah, I think it's the latter. Um, I don't have any evidence that these other books were sources or, or like major influences. Um, some of them are even like, they're satire, which is kind of fun to read. Like, um, uh, which one is the, But um, uh, they, they, so part of, uh, part of what was happening at that time is um, they had newspapers uh, in circulars and they would have um, political agendas. People would write to the newspaper and they would have this idea and they would want to be as persuasive as possible. They would step up the biblical language in order to kind of bring in the rich um, discourse and analogy that was possible in that, in that mode of speaking in order to be per persuasive. And um, so some of these are just like one one page news, newspaper broadside or something right. like that. Others are full books. Um, but uh, uh, they're, they're, um, they're all, all over the map as far as subject content. I think the Book of Mormon and maybe one other one was religious in content. Well, there are a couple religious ones, but um, majority are historical, satire, or political in, in nature. Um, and I, I doubt that he saw many of them. He may have seen some of them. Like, you know, newspapers in his local area probably had a few in print. Um, I'm, uh, you know, our current hypothesis is that the late war was a school textbook he used, but um, I'm not sure if, if they were seen all over. Is, you know. is that the book that's being passed around? Yeah. Because I, I opened it up and I just randomly opened it up and started reading it. I thought I was reading the Book of Mormon. <laughs> 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 Just randomly yeah. open it up. Well, you like to open it's interesting that that history is, it's very, um, you know, like, uh, the Americans are the good guys and the British are the evil guys, right? And so it's so polarized, like the Book of Mormon story is about the Lamanites and the Nephites. I think that's kind of the, the, the feeling that, that was in the air at that time. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, people in Joseph Smith's time, after he wrote the Book of Mormon, said, hey, you stole that book from the Jews or people, and whatever. We, we never heard of anyone suggesting in his own time or shortly after that he stole it from the late war. Right. But don't you think that a whole lot of people that read the late war in that time, does that hurt hurt your your hypothesis any? I mean, if I was a Mormon apologist, I'd be, oh, well, what, you say that so many people have read it, you know, so mm -hmm. why didn't anyone ever suggest it then? Or maybe it's yeah. just, you know, there's so little like the View of the Heroes or whatever, some of those books. What's the other one that you think? They, well, View of the Heroes. <laughs> they, the yeah. story is very parallel, you know, that kind of stuff. This mm -hmm. necessarily, the story isn't the same, just some of the four word grams or whatever are the same. Right. right. I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I think um, that, uh, part, so part of the problem is that this was so common, right? So to be able to link that particular book with this particular mm -hmm. book, somebody would have had to have been exposed to both of them and to have yeah. this, yeah. So I um, I don't think that it was, how do I say that? I think that there was um, exposure to this, 
type of writing enough that it felt normal, mm -hmm. but not so much that everyone knew about every other book, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I, the, I mean, the question that obviously brings up, or at least it brings up for me, is the, the sort of the distinction between word choice and subject matter. Yeah. Um, yeah because I, I've never read the late, uh, late war, and you know, I've seen a little bit of the stuff that you guys have done. It, it, subject matter wise, I mean, obviously there's the war chapters in the Book of Mormon, but short of that, is there, is a, is there a strong subject matter correlation? Yeah between the two books or? Well, so it's interesting that um, there's definitely some sections that don't correlate. So I think that's what um, LDS apologists would point to. It's like, well, you, you've looked at only the correlations and not the ones that don't. Um, but there are a surprising number of correlations. So it's hard, it's hard to balance that in a way that says that's satisfyingly one way or the other. Um, not all of it is about war. Like there's a very strong sense of um, like patriotism and like defending your country. There's, there's, um, there's, uh, um, the title of liberty is mentioned, uh, not in exactly those words, but the American flag and the title of liberty, there's definitely like correlations going on here as, as far as uh, subject matter. Um, the, the king men versus the free men, this is a theme in the Book of Mormon. It's very clear in the, in the late war that it talks about the Tories and the free men. Um, so that sort of mm -hmm. subject matter is clear. Um, I think if actually, if oh, I yeah. could just break in for yeah. a moment. Uh, I'd like to thank Dwayne for coming out to uh, present this for us, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Um, we're about the point where we wanted to end, and so I'd like to wrap up really quick. When I'm done, anybody who wants to continue asking questions can feel free to do so, and we'll continue recording it. We'll be posting this up on YouTube when we're done. But we'd like to be doing presentations like this about every month or so. So if you have somebody who you would like to hear a presentation from, please uh, let us know about that and we will do our best to set that up. And also if you know of any places like this that we could use as a venue to make presentations, we would also appreciate that. We're very grateful to Ron and other people who have allowed their homes and businesses to be used for this, but uh, the more people who can uh, step up and provide a location, uh, the better. <laughs> so I'd like to Thank you. And if you have to leave, don't uh, don't feel embarrassed like you're walking out on anybody. So feel free to get up and go. But if you'd like to continue uh, discussing this and asking questions, then you're.